And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started by introducing our MC for the day, the Chairman Emeritus of the Amelia Island Concord and former contributing editor of Road and Track. Right. Thank you so much. This is Bill Warner. Welcome. Thank you very much, Cindy. We're going to have a wonderful time here with uh, Talking Classic Cars Live with some of the greatest personalities in racing and in classic car business. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our host for today. Born in Portland, Connecticut. He worked with his dad from early childhood on everything from a Model A Ford to a Duesenberg. He is known worldwide for his highly successful show, Chasing Classic Cars. I tell you, he is known worldwide because my wife and I were in uh, Goodwood recently. We went to a beautiful town in England called Bath. We call it Bath in, in Florida, but they call it Bath. And I walked into this art store and a guy's talking, we're talking cars. He says, you're from the United States. I said, yes. He says, do you know Wayne Carini? I said, I sure do. So ladies and gentlemen, the worldwide known Wayne Carini. Uh, years ago, I was uh, making a tour of uh, Northern California, and I had a chance to go to Pixar, and I ran into a gentleman who was giving me a tour. Now, you run across people, and you can find out right away they were really car people. He had his top, now it's 50 at that time, his top 10 European and American cars on his cell phone. He began his Pixar career in 1998 with the Monsters and his Guardian of the Cars franchise, for Pixar. He owns a 57 Pontiac Safari wagon and a 1976 Porsche 911. Creative director of Cars Franchise from Memoryville, California, Mr. Jay Ward. Okay, okay, gentlemen, you're on. Yeah, this one is on. You can tap the bottom if you need to, or you're on. Yeah, it's on. All right. It's on. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? We good? All right. That's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. I hope you guys are all having a good car week. You, so you, got, you, got, you got your whole own, I, your own audience. I pay good money to get a lot of people yelling in the front row. It costs me a lot to do that, but it's worth it. Two dollars, right? <laughs> so thank you, Bill, for the introduction. And, uh, you know, we, we've got some real special guests today, and we want a special guest to come out. Um, why don't you introduce Amanda? Yeah, so for those of you who have been to Pebble Beach before, you probably heard Derek up there doing the MC work. This year, Amanda Stratton has stepped in to sort of be that new person, stepping in that role, but she's so much more than that. She's got a history in motorsport, Formula E, racer, commentator, um, and really a true sporting enthusiast. So I'm very excited. Amanda, come on out. Come on out, Amanda. There we are. Perfect. So you're, this is the voice you were here for many years to come here at Pebble Beach, I hope. <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks yeah. for the vote of confidence. I hope so. Um, it's obviously, as they said, my first time. Uh, to, I've taken over as MC from Derek, so I've got huge shoes to fill. Um, if anybody wants to give me any, any advice, any feedback, I'm actually open to it. So, um, yeah. But be nice. Only nice feedback, please. That's all we could ask. Be nice. Uh, Amanda and I were talking backstage, and, um, you know, sh you can tell that she is not from Carmel. The accent is a little different. Um, deep love of Goodwood. Um, you and I have both been a number of times and talked about that. I I'm just going to jump right in. Tell us a little bit, for those who don't know, about Goodwood, either Revival, FOS, and what you love about it. Well... Um, okay, for those of you who don't know what Goodwood is, first of all, um, it's a big country house in the southern part of England, in Sussex. Um, there was a racetrack there. It closed down because of safety reasons. And the guy that lives there, who is now the Duke of Richmond, um, wanted to reopen it. But the council wouldn't let him because they said the circuit was dangerous and there were noise issues. In England, I've just got to say, in England, we have this real hang-up about noise and cars. This is why I love coming to the States, <laughs> because you guys seem to think the noisier they are, the better. But anyway, the, the local people were really strung out about the noise, so he started what was the Festival of Speed, which was a, a hill climb up the driveway of his house. Yep. And there were all sorts of cars. There were Formula One cars, there were rally cars... There were static displays, and this has grown and grown over the years. It is now monstrous. I was lucky enough to um, present the Goodwood Festival of Speed, and then the revival when that started, 
Um, and I worked there for 15 years, so I saw it grow from really what was a small, almost like a garden party, into the absolute enormous thing that it is now. And um, I only stopped commentating when I was offered too many nice cars to drive, and I decided I was going <laughs> to drive them instead. But it is definitely a bucket list thing. If you ever get a chance, festivals be in the summer, revival in the fall, and they're amazing. 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 You will see cars... You'll see cars. I mean, how he gets them. It's a little bit like this. It is. Um, except these are obviously more racing orientated. How he gets the cars there on... on and I mean, you know, they, the TT, which is one of the races at Revival. I mean, the grid, they, they tally up the cost of the cars that are on the grid. These cars are racing wheel to wheel and they're not hanging around. No. And Goodwood is a track that by any modern standards just would not be sanctioned because no. there is no runoff area. Um, in fact, Danny can talk about that as well because he's raced there too. Yeah. Um, there's no runoff area. It's very fast. Bumps all over the place. You know, bumps as you go into a corner which unsettle the car. Um, but so by any modern, modern standards, you would never get this, no. this track approved. And then it's a Ferrari GTO against an AC Cobra against a lightweight Coombsy. The, the, the Jato a Cobra bread van and... In, exactly. A, bread, a, little bit, a little bit of everything. Galaxy 500s, yeah. Ford I Galaxies, know. yeah, the St. Mary's. Well, in the St. Mary's, I was racing um, a Fiat Arbath, not a small, but it was an Arbath. Uh, it was like a little mini saloon car with, in fact, a mini Cooper with the Galaxies. And I swear yeah. to God, you've never felt so small in your life. Yeah, well, I mean, they're, they're winning in the corners, but the Galaxy blows by them on the straightaways. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and your education, from what I understand, you, you wanted to be an auctioneer. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> um, so I, I never had, I, there was never an ambition for me, well, there was never a plan for me to end up doing what I ended up doing. When I was sort of 12, 13, sort of moving through education, um, there was no one for me to aspire to. I knew I loved racing. Um, I actually started racing motocross bikes when I was 13 years old. And I knew I wanted to be involved in racing, but there were no jobs. There was nothing obvious for me to actually aspire to do unless I was a, a mechanic or an engineer. So I was happy racing and needed to get a proper job that was going to finance my racing. Um, and so that's where I ended up working at Christie's. And I was sort of on track on a, on a program to perhaps be their first female auctioneer. When I left college and my degree, I was offered a job by Channel 4, which is an, a broadcaster in the UK. And I never took the job at Christie's. My mother went bananas. She was not happy. She's happy now, though. <laughs> Phew, thank goodness. Um, but my mother was not happy. And um, I've been sort of doing this ever since. And, and it's really a uh, great education and great opportunity for you to be here and be part of the Pebble Beach Concord de Elegance. Uh, you know, I've, I've been, my career here, this is my 39th straight year coming here. And I've seen a, a few presenters in my time, but we're excited to have you as that person. Thank you very much. I yeah. can't wait. And this is not your first time at Pebble Beach. No, no. So please tell the guests, <laughs> for those who don't know, that you came here as an entrant. I did. So in 2014, I actually came here um, with a car. Um, I came here with a Jaguar XK120 fixed head, which was the original Geneva show car of the fixed head. Um, it was a car that was also owned by Clark Gable. And... We looked around at the other cars. I mean, it was a nightmare. I was telling you the whole story about getting the car here and the car was late. And anyway, the car ended up getting here on time just so that we could do the tour. And we did the tour and then all sorts of other issues. But anyway, we got onto the lawn, um, you know, at six o'clock in the morning. And, you know, you're just still jet lagged, still feeling overwhelmed, just trying to take it all in. And we looked around and thought, not a chance. Have we, we haven't got a chance against these cars. So we were just were quite relaxed and just thought, you know, we're just here to fill space and this is lovely. Next thing we know, we win the class. So I have a 100% success rate so far. <laughs> yeah, not bad to be your first time invited to Pebble Beach and win your class. That's, that's, that's pretty good yeah. bragging, that's, right? That's difficult, I can yeah. tell you that. Yeah, I know. So I'm rather hoping that I follow on that 
that winning streak this weekend. That's great. Welcome back. Well, welcome back, and and welcome is is the presenter now of the Pebble Beach Concord Elegance, and we're looking forward to having you for a long time. Thank you very much. Yeah. I look forward to being here for a long time. So we're going to bring our, our next guest, and, and this is a guy that everybody knows, of course, racing, if you follow racing. They call him a nickname, Spin and Win. I don't know what that's all about, but well, uh, Danny Sullivan, come on out. Let's, let's, uh, let's find out what Spin and Win means. Tough crowd here. Welcome. Thank you. I was great listening to you. Was it? Yeah. Oh, you're so kind. You know, uh, bringing back memories of Goodwood. It's very special. It's, it is an incredible place. But we didn't meet first at Goodwood. We can't talk about that. Okay. okay. <laughs> oh, come on. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Where did you first meet? Yeah. Well, I think we first met do it with um, American Le Mans series. Oh, God. That long ago. That long ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Doesn't she a, look good? I'm the old one here in this whole deal. So talking but, about where we meet, so Danny and I, you would think we met at a racetrack or something else, but we actually sat next to each other in an airplane from Denver to Aspen, Colorado once, yeah. and I looked over and I said, aren't you Danny Sullivan? He goes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So that's that our, was, our first time. Uh, we don't want to remember all these things. That, right. Aspen was a long time ago. I mean, I lived there so many, so many years ago. Yeah. Goodwood, by the way, uh, they had the hill climb that you were talking about, just to clarify, because you said that I'd been there in between that and the uh, revival. I did it 22 times. Did you? 22 times between the two, two of the things. In fact, one, one at the revival, I won three races one day at the Not revival, bad. including the TT Glover Trophy and one of the other ones. That's, that That's is amazing. That, it is impressive. It was, but Lord March, or we all know him as Charles. He used to be Lord March. Now he's a Duke of Richmond. He was so good to all of us and always, would you like to drive this car? Would you like to drive this? I mean, he's an amazing guy, which is why Goodwood is, is what it is. Yeah. And it's kind of like how this, now we're in Pebble Beach with all this is going on. I used to live right up the hill until a couple of years ago. It never ceased to amaze me. It just gets bigger. There's more cars. This guy, we, we've had more parties together and, and yes. stuff like that and this guy's got you all remember the movie cars you know the introduction yeah. all of that animated film. cars is in his head <laughs> everything is in his head there all of that is created right there thank you danny yeah. yeah and you are the glue in this area because when i started coming down to pebble beach and you know we started coming here for the movie cars for research almost 20 years ago, geez. And Danny would say, you gotta meet this guy, and you gotta meet this guy, and we're gonna get everybody together at this party, and I would end up at these crazy places in Monterey hanging out with you. You're just so good at people in motorsport and the car world and bringing people together like a glue, and that's what I love He's about He's the mayor. It. Yeah. I don't know about that. You know, I think Bill, Bill, the Bill's the mayor, and you guys know his background. He's, He's amazing. So speaking of Bill, Bill, you've got some stats. Let's hear your stats about Danny. I mean, you know. Uh, oh, boy. Pe people uh, don't really realize. There we go. He's oh, got the rap great, great driver Danny is. <laughs> well, I have to go to my notes on that because there's so many stats. But he 17 cart wins, winner of the 1983 Indy 500, winner of the cart championship and triple crown. And you drove Formula One, World Endurance Championship, Indy car, cart car. Is there anything you didn't drive? Well, NASCAR, you even had a stab, did NASCAR, stab at NASCAR. Did NASCAR, did DTM, and did Baja. And Baja. Did the Baja 1000 and uh, two times in a trophy truck and once in a buggy. And you're working on a track now for South Florida. We're, we're, we got a track development down in Florida in St. Lucie County, just north of Palm Beach, about 40 minutes, 650 acres. It's a club. It won't be a track, uh, as we know, like Laguna Seca. It's a club, but it'll be four tracks. Largest one's 4.2 miles. Elevation changes. Anybody knows anything about Florida? That's very rare. <laughs> a smaller track, we can actually turn the sprinklers on and wet it in certain, for about 2.2 miles. So we can have damp, intermediate, or full wet. Alligators? Uh, if there's water in Florida, there's alligators. Okay, so they, they go hand in hand. But they, you will try to keep those off the track. But, um, and we've got 650 acres. That's mar marvelous. It's needed down there. Well, you know, the Amanda and I were talking beforehand. I had, when, I, when I moved from here, I had five motorcycles, four or five cars left. Sold every place because there's nothing, nowhere to drive them down there. 
the most fun you have is on ramps or off ramps because everything <laughs> else is pretty, pretty straight. Well, what's happening too, we're getting all these cars. I mean, look at the cars next door at Mercedes or McLaren or anything. They're all phenomenal. Everybody's making bigger, faster cars. Nobody's got a place to drive them. And so this gives you the opportunity with the track car or your road car if you want to take it out as a club member. So I think it's going to be, and they're popping up, by the way. They're building one up near Chattanooga. Up near Jacksonville also. Jack, yeah, and there's, um, they got a small one in Tampa. They've got them around. They're popping up because of the same thing. People want to go someplace where it's safe, where they can drive their car and have fun. Yeah. Danny, I want to go back a little bit. You know, we, we saw each other at Monaco this year, and you and K.K. Rosberg were talking about racing at Monaco in the rain. Yeah. So for those of you who know anything about Formula One, Monaco is a crown jewel because it is a street circuit that goes back decades. And if you get it wrong at Monaco, you're in the Armco. There's no... There's or in the water. Or in the water, if you've ever watched the movie <laughs> Grand Prix from 1966. Danny, you raced there and did rather well because of the rain. You and K.K. were talking about that. Will you just quickly tell us a little bit about... You're racing in the rain. Was it 76 was your season? No, it was 83. 83. And tell me who else was on the grid in 83 that year. Who was uh, fine? PK, Prost, uh, Mansell. Can't remember everybody. That was, but those are, there's a lot of world championships. 83, right there. yeah, they're, exactly. They're, okay. In those days in Formula One, you didn't make a pit stop. They filled them up with gas and you started with the tires on it. If you made a pit stop, it was not the fast two second, three second pit stops. Guy came in with a jack. I mean, it was a quick lift jack and a little, you know, I think even then they, they didn't Man, have manual lug wrench. They had the manual and it's raining. And I don't know how many people have been to Monaco. I'm not looking for a show of hands, but the Alps Maritime are right there. The mountains are right there and they're big mountains. And it's just a little area down on the sea and the weather can change pretty fast. And it rained and it had been raining and it was still raining. And I'm, I had qualified last on the grid, 20th. Nikki Lauda and John Watson in the McLaren didn't qualify. Nikki so, Lauda did not qualify. <laughs> Nikki Lauda did not qualify. So it was a big kudos to be on the deal. And Elio DeAngelis was in the JPS uh, Lotus. And so I'm last. He's a little bit staggered over there. It's pouring with rain. And Tyrrell, Ken Tyrrell, my team owner, comes up and he says, so which tires do you want? And I'm about to go, and he goes, we're starting on slicks, on dry tires, okay? And he said, it's going to stop raining. And I'm looking there. Elio looks over at me, and he goes, are you crazy? <laughs> Point at the arm. Yeah. And so, needless to say, dried out. It took about 22 laps or something to dry out. But those early laps were the most frightening things that you can't imagine in a Formula One car. The thing at the time weighed 1,160 pounds. You know, you had 500 horsepower, slick tires, narrow track, greasy, everything. But the most amazing story was Keke started on the front row with Alain Prost. And Alain Prost was in the Renault. And it was the beginning of the turbocharged era. So he had a turbo. Keke and I were in normally aspirated Cosworths. And Keke was on slicks and Alain was on uh, wets. And Alain was really good in the wet. Yeah. He was a really, he was known to be a really good rain driver. Yeah, if you watch the movie Senna, that shows clearly how well he could keep up with Ayrton Senna in the rain. Yeah, he was, Alain was, the guy was, I mean, four world championships. So this was in the old days where you came out of the tunnel and you went down to the chicane, but the chicane was just a quick left-right flick out onto the waterfront, not the one that they've got now to, to slow the cars down more. So it's raining. And I, of course, I'm in the back, so I'm spray everything. Keke, on slicks, outbraked Prost into the chicane, in the wet, outbraked him on the deal. And typical, if anybody ever saw Keke drive, it was all, bop, 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 bop. He was always on the throttle. He was like all over on the throttle. Bop, 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 like this. Came out of the chicane. That was it. Prost told me afterwards, he said, I was so disheartened by that pass that I, that I couldn't keep up with him. Oh, wow. He, he couldn't keep up with him. And Keke went on to win it, and I, fin I came from last and finished fifth. Well, Ken Tyrrell, being an Englishman, is a pro at uh, rain. Right. <laughs> exactly. And he was right. I mean, he was right. If I could keep it off of the fence for what it turned out, it was almost 27 laps, then I was going to be okay. There was a few guys crashed. And Am I allowed to ask questions? Yeah. Okay. Sure. What, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah. Wait, but, but Monaco is really hard to pass. Very. 
So how did you make up all those places? There was a couple of places that, remember when they're on wet tires and they start going away and you're on slicks, but the problem is the dry line was on, was there, as you know, and off of it was wet. I just so so presumably hustled. they're on the wet, not racing line. Well, they were trying to cool, their and tires. they're trying to they cool their tires. A, they yep. left a door open, and I and I was there. My wife and I were there, and it was pouring rain, and we were on the bleachers down by the swimming pool corner, and the bleachers were being rocked by the water sloshing back and forth, and there was jellyfish unbelievable. And she goes, <laughs> "What the heck am I doing here?" <laughs> It, uh, you know, I had the same thought during, at the start. <laughs> the but um, the sexy side of racing yeah, when you're yeah. sitting in the rain watching. Yeah. Has anybody ever been to Monaco for the Formula One? Yeah, yeah there you go. It's um, it's a unique place. It, it is another crown jewel, just like Goodwood. Yeah. Uh, talking about F1, I want to go forward a little bit. What happened with Red Bull? Because you you sure. were there before Red Bull really had, I guess, Toro Rosso, right? Were you part of the development for the junior team when they were trying to get Americans into motorsport? How did that happen, your connection with F1, with Red Bull? I was living back in Europe, and I had read an article in the Financial Times about how Red Bull was going to do a push into America. Yeah. Red Bull's not been in America for that long. They started in 97, but then they kind of had a bit of a false start with a distributor and so forth. So it didn't really get cranked until about three or four years later. And I'm reading this article about how they're going into the market and they want to find young American drivers. And Patrick Long, I don't know how many of you all know Patrick Long, drove for Porsche as one of the ambassadors, uh, created a Lufkanelt, the air-cooled event, everything. He had been bugging me to try to help him to get money to help American drivers come to Europe and race in Formula One. And I'd gone through this myself when I was trying to do it. And I'd contacted a lot of companies and so forth. So I read this article and I called Jos Capito, who was the COO of Sauber at the time. Yeah, who just left Williams last year. Yeah, yeah. but Yost I knew very well because when I drove for Porsche, the Dower Porsche at Le Mans, he had been there running part of the program and we'd become good friends. And I called him and said, hey, do you know Dietrich Matsushi, owner of Red Bull? And he goes, nah, I know him a little bit, but Heinz Kindergartner knows him real well. Heinz is a very famous enduro motorcycle rider, very famous rider from Austria. So he said, call Heinz. I called Heinz and, and he said, here's Didi's number. His nickname was Didi, Dietrich. Here's his number. I said, I can't call him. It's Sunday. He said, if you want to get a hold of him, call him today. So I called him. I said, hey, I'm sorry to call you on a Sunday. I'm Danny Sullivan, this is my background, da, da, da. He goes, I know who you are. What can I do for you? And I said, I'm interested in starting a driver search program for Americans. And, and I went through kind of what I had in mind. And he said, it was a long time ago. He said, send me a fax. Yeah. Okay. So I sent him a fax, just an outline, two paragraphs. Boom, boom. I get a call from his office. Come see us. So I didn't know really what Red Bull was. I mean, we knew it. We didn't know that it's this hip, young, extreme sport kind of. So, of course, I'm going to sell something, so I go in a suit, okay, to Red Bull, okay? If I'm at Red Bull, I'm overdraft for Red Bull right now, okay? <laughs> so I get there, and, and Didi was a character. Every time I ever saw him, he was in jeans, a white shirt, leather jacket, and cowboy boots. Yeah. Every time I have ever seen the man. One time he had a sport coat on over the, instead of a leather jacket. But anyway, we're sitting in there, and he says, okay, get with Thomas Uberall, who was the sports guy. And he said, done. And that was it. That's how it started, the Red Bull Driver Search Program. We got Scott Speed, a lot of guys, Joey Han that drives for Ford. All these guys were in the program. I mean, where we tried to get them into the, into the program. And literally, that's how, it, that's how it started, was a conversation like that. Wow, that's and, something else. Hey, Wayne, along that same line, I was talking with the folks from General Motors and Cadillac is going to be making a, a run at Formula One and the announcement should come soon. And they're saying they, they'd really like to have an American driver in the Cadillac car. Who do you see, American? You know, I, I'd probably, I don't know if you could ever get him, but I'd probably go with somebody like Joseph Newgarden. He'd fit the Cal Cadillac brand. I've talked to Joseph enough. I don't think he'd have any problems adapting to driving over there um, or, or even living there. That was the mistake that Michael Andretti made back in the, when he drove for McLaren is he tried to commute back and forth the way his dad did. But when his dad was doing it, it was a different era and his dad was also competing in the States as well. And like anything, you've got to get engaged and become part of the fabric of, of Formula One. 
And I don't necessarily mean you got to live right by the factory or anything like that, but you need to be there. You need to be there. And I think it was sad for me because Michael and Reddy, he, his teammate, was there in Senna. And they were probably the most complicated Formula One cars ever, okay, at that time. And we all forget, toward the end of the deal, he was almost as quick as Ayrton. You know, he had a third place at Monza and stuff like that. And I think that if he had really engaged himself in that, he would have been a world champion. He, he had the talent to do it. So I think Joseph would be at the top of the line. I'd probably look around some of the sports car guys that are racing over here, because I think we saw when Mark Weber went to Porsche, he wasn't the fastest guy on the team by a long way. And Mark came out on top, and he was at the top of his game there. So I think we'd have to look around a little bit, a little bit more. And then people have talked about Colton Herta. Colton drove for um, Christian Horner when he had his team before he went into Formula One. So he's got a lot of European experience. The big question, too, is how long is it going to take them to get in? And if they don't get in until 26 or even 27, that's, that's a ways down the road. Somebody else might pop up between now and them that all of a sudden shines. And I think they'd want to have some European experience in the team. You wouldn't want to go to take two guys with no F1 experience and put them in there and try to develop a Formula One car. They need to know how to make a proper cup of tea. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> um, so our next guest was, I believe, stuck in some traffic, but we want to bring him out. There he is. There he comes. Adam Carolla. Adam Carolla. <laughs> Well. Have a seat, Adam. Thanks for making it. Oh, my pleasure. A little traffic, traffic jam. Uh, we, you know, I don't know if you guys have tried ways in these hills, but uh, it's a little tough finding parking lot 11, but we, we made it. Yeah. We're here. <laughs> well, great. You know, all of the, these people up here are racers not myself included or Jay, but Bill's been racing forever and photographing racing and Adam has been racing and making films about racing. And, uh, and of course we know Amanda and Danny, but tell us what's going on in your life. Uh, well, uh, for, for you guys, uh, we're making, uh, we're finishing up a film on Dan Gurney. So we did a doc on Paul Newman's racing life. We did a doc on uh, Willie T. Ribbs uh, racing life. We did a doc on Ford, versus Ferrari, and we did a Shelby American doc, and so now we're, we're just finishing the uh, Gurney doc, and we're e well into a Bobby Ray Hall doc as well. Wow. You're busy. <laughs> well, you know, uh, you got to, as you know, you have to farm things out to capable people. You're not... Uh, running an orbital sander on every fender. You just got to get guys who can right. do it well. That's right. Know the people to call on. Right. But, uh, and you're racing also. Now, have you been at the track this weekend? Uh, this is the first year in 12 years I've not brought a, a car out and raced. This year was just the, you know, crack a beer and walk around and enjoy yourself and, you know, stop staring at the clock and getting into the car and all that kind of thing. But uh, in the past, um, lots of Newman Z cars and, you know, Newman 935 and uh, some uh, BRE Roadster, uh, Pete Brock, I hope you guys all appreciate uh, as well. A smattering applause for Pete. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, any, any Datsun or Porsche, you know, we could get into uh, in the past. Um, the last time... I was here, was in a professional Trans Am race, and I kind of put the car on the wall a little bit. So I thought we'd just walk around as a spectator this, uh, this time around. Take it all in. Yeah, yeah. take but it all in. Let's just talk about Paul Newman for a minute, because that, that's important to you. And, and if, for those of you who have not seen the documentary Winning, it, it's fantastic. For, I mean, honestly, what, for your first real feature film, what you did was incredible to peel back the layers of... Paul Newman is an actor, yes, but a guy who started racing at, what, 46 years old, began mm -hmm. professional racing, mm -hmm. and how good he was and how serious he took it. You did an excellent job on that movie. What, what got you to first recognize it's such a niche thing to say, I want to collect Paul Newman's race cars? That, that's unusual. Well, you know, I originally started off just collecting Datsun race cars, and I was always a big Datsun fan. I was a, a Datsun race car fan, and so I started... Dotson race cars started coming up for sale, and they'd say, oh, there's a 300, 
ZX, you know, turbo V6, uh, two frame car, uh, Datsun, you, you know, you might be interested in this car. And then they'd go, oh, and it was, oh, and Paul Newman raced it. And so I was kind of collecting Datsuns and Nissans that Paul Newman happened to have raced. And at some point when I got about three or four race cars in, I was like, well, maybe I'm more of a Newman collector than I am a Nissan collector. Although I, I love BRE and Pete Brock and the 2000 Roadsters and I have a couple of BRE 510s and the Hino Transport, by the way, which is very cool. Probably, yeah, it's probably a little too inside baseball for even this crowd. But the first Hino brought to this country, uh, Pete Brock got hold of it, gave it to Max Belchowski. He put a Cadillac engine in it, and that's what he used to haul the BRE five, uh, Roadsters and 510s and stuff a along the way in the early iterations. But at some point, it, it, it dawned on me that I was becoming a Paul Newman car collector versus a Nissan car collector. And uh, Newman drove for Nissan with Bob Sharp, you know, Datsun, Bob Sharp, Nissan, Newman Sharp. And then he moved on to uh, Oldsmobile at a certain point. And I probably Datsun, Nissan, then, then Oldsmobile, but and, and, and all various other rides he could catch along the way, Daytona, Le Mans, wherever, whoever would have him with a, with a ride. But uh, yeah, I started racing his cars and collecting his cars and rebuilding his cars. And, and people would say to me like, what, Paul Newman, what? The salad dressing guy? I'd say, no, he's a <laughs> car racer, he's a big car racer. Oh, the salad dressing guy, the popcorn guy. And I'd go, no one got the story. So I was like, I got to tell the story because it, uh, enough people didn't didn't know what it was. And of course, you, Bill, you fo you forgot the TR6. And Bill had the first one, the first championship car, the the Triumph TR6. Yeah, which was uh, always o always a car I was I was pursuing and interested in. But uh, yeah, so I guess when you make films, you you walk around. Enough people say I don't know what you're talking about, and eventually you go, all right, now we we have to make a film to let people know what we're talking about. And not only was Paul a race car driver, but he was a team owner. Um, he fed the team. I mean, he would be the chef feeding everybody that worked on the cars. I mean, Paul was a, was a really great guy. I got to know him in Connecticut um, sure. because he built a hole in the wall gang um, for ki kids with cancer to go have a place to go in the summer camp. And he did wonderful things. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I mean, the dressing the, the salad dressing sort of grew out of the racing where he would stay, you know, they'd go up to Road Atlanta for four days. He'd fire up the barbecue. And, you know, Bob Sharp told me all the stories. He wanted 20% fat in his ground beef and all this stuff. And he'd be making a salad. And at some point he said to uh, Bob Sharp that he wanted, you know, he wanted to make salad dressing and just sell it and donate the money. And he wanted this sort of highfalutin, sort of long neck, uh, bottle and this and that and the other. And um, if you look at Paul Newman's salad dressing today in Ken's, which is very popular, uh, Bob Sharp knew Ken. And he said, I, I can hook you up with Ken. And, you know, Newman said, I want this bottle that's this and that. And Ken said, look, we got three bottles. Pick one. And so if you go to the supermarket today and you see the Paul Newman salad dressing, the Ken salad dressing, it's the same, same bottle. bottle because that's who, <laughs> that's who Bob Sharp knew, Connecticut guy, obviously. And he just put them together and, and the rest is history. So, so uh, this is a question for you. I mean, of Paul Newman's cars, is there a unicorn? Is there one out there that you've heard about that you'd love to find that nobody's found in a while. A lot of race cars get packed into a wall and rebuilt and changed. You know, it's pretty rare to find 100%. Other, other than a Volvo station wagon? Uh, oh, we'll talk after the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's some interesting Newman stories. The, the 935 is sort of the holy grail because he, he ran it at Le Mans. He ran it out, out here at Watkins Glen, I think, for a six-hour race as well. Uh, so that's kind of the holy grail. But there is some stuff out there. There's like a Ferrari 308 that he ran with like Gene Hackman and uh, maybe uh, 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 Gardner uh, from um, Rockford Files, James, James Gardner, Gardner, I think. Gardner. And they had like a transport sponsored by Budweiser. Like 
there is still some weird, funky stuff that's out there that people ran for a season. Maybe, I think it was Clint Eastwood, James Garner, uh, maybe Gene Hackman and uh, James Garner ran this like 308 Ferrari sponsored by Bud in like, you know, in like 1978 or something for like a season with the transport. So there's, there's always some weird stuff sprinkled around out there, but I have most of his cars that he ran for the seasons and, you know, not just the kind of one and done, yeah. hopped in, did Daytona and then hopped out. Although I'd love to have the Nobody's Fool Roush Mustang or something that won Daytona, class of Daytona with. But I, I kind of like the, the cars that he ran the season with, you know, where you, you sit in the car and it's worn a certain way and he's got little stuff on the dash and he's still Sharpie with like arrows pointing at the temp and stuff. And it, it was like, this is where he sat for the whole the whole year, you know? Yeah, like a fighter pilot. We, we brought the Volvo station wagon up because Paul had three Volvo wagons with 302 Fords with Kenny, uh, Kenny uh, Bell superchargers put in it. And I own... Paul's uh, uh, and, and Adam and I have been talking about that for a few years to to maybe change didn't, ownership. But didn't uh, one of them just come up for auction? No, that that was a car that was built for him, but he did not build the car. Okay. He built the, the the Fords. What was, was did he build them or brought? Did Brockman? No, it was actually a gentleman in Maine actually okay. that, that put the engines in. What was the Buick V6 one that came up and sold? That was the one that the, um, the, the racing team made for Paul when he was getting it, when he was ill, actually, and they never got to actually give it to him. So, oh, okay, so, so the ones aren't real official ones. Like, right. I know... Mine was registered <laughs> to him, and so I yeah. did that. Yours has, like, Sierra Nevada bottle tops in the, in the back seat, right? Actually, it's got Paul Newman's uh, tennis clothes. So Paul had just played tennis that morning, and he sold the car to the guy who never took his clothes out of the back. <laughs> so still got his shorts, his socks, and his sweatshirt in the back of the car. Adam, this is it. It's got the DNA. You need this uh, one. <laughs> He, Wayne's just making a pitch. He's just trying to pump. He's trying to pump the price up. Oh, those, I'm those, still oh, a those car salesman. Those were kid cars. So <laughs> having, having been there, just yeah. hold, hold out, hold out. He'll come through. I'll come around. That's right. You had a little experience with that build, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So do you know the building in the middle of the track here was the Newman Racing Shop? Because when I raced for Paul, that was our uh, in Canada. Right. That was our. You know the building out there in the middle of the paddock at Laguna Seca. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was Paul's shop. Oh, well, really? it is a I'd Newman say, building. You go now. over now. They put they put the net sign back up on it, on the uh, track side. It says Newman uh, Newman Racing. But that they built the county built that for him to ha house his can am team. That's oh, where, really? That's where I drove for him. Oh, the, you drive the uh, Budweiser car? I drove the Bud Can Am car. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you, I called it HMS Budweiser. There's, a, a thing. there's another one for <laughs> you, Adam. It's got, it's got great history, Adam. That's the one. Oh, the Budweiser Can yeah. car? Yeah. I know where it is. It's in, uh, well, the one, the last one I drove is in Florida um, uh, with a, a guy as a collector that's got it. It's out of New York. Those things have a big block in them? They, they were, no, they were small blocks, but they. But that uh, Hillborn VA, injection or something? They were, fill, they were injectors. Yeah, they were injectors. And they, he, our engines were built by a guy from Salinas, Ryan Falconer. I don't know if you guys remember Ryan. Remember he made the clever guy. He made a V12 out of the V8. He mm. just made a different block with four more cylinders. Redid the crank and the cams, and he made the V12. Did you ever see uh, Chevrolet did a prototype V12 with a Falconer motor in it? That, that was my project. Was that your project? Yeah, I'd put that whole thing together with, um, uh, what was his name from G GM that ran Delphi? Uh, Runkle, Don Runkle. And we put that car together. They still have it. Yeah. A Adam, I don't know if you remember, but the last movie Paul Newman did before he died was Cars. Sure. A film that I worked on. And we were really fortunate to get Paul. And he was still amazing. I still, and, and, and you know this, voice acting is probably more difficult in some ways than being on camera. And, and Paul showed up and literally wrote the character Doc Hudson. You know, we had written the lines for the movie and Paul was like, no, nah, that's not what he would say. No. You know, that's not what a racer would do. And we said, 
Paul, what would you say here? What would you do here? You know, what's, McQueen wouldn't be driving around on the street on slicks. He would have groove tires. We changed a lot of stuff in the movie because of what Paul asked us to do. And then that year, uh, the year that the movie Cars came out, he raced a 12 hours of Sebring in a, 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 a prototype car, and we sponsored it and put the Cars film logo. Yeah. The movie came out, and he raced that car. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, was, it was uncanny. I mean, it, at the end, he had his age as his number. 84, I think. On yeah. the car. I think it got to 83. 83, okay. I was like 82, 83. I mean, he's in a Trans Am vet. He's at Lime Rock. He won at, at Lime 80, Rock. At how, how old did he win at Lime Rock? I think 83. 83 I mean, years like old and he won at Lime close Rock. Close to the end of his, of his life. And, a, and, a, and, you know, in a big... Trans Am vet, not, you know, Spec Miata. You know, he was, no, no offense to your Spec Miata people. <laughs> 130 horsepower? Yeah, 130 <laughs> horsepower. <laughs> As you drove the car to the track. Yeah. You know, but no, I mean, this is a big bore vet. And he's hauling ass in that thing at, uh, at Lime Rock. And uh, yeah, he raced all the, all the way to, to the end. You know, I have, I have a lot of his fire suits. I have his helmets. You know, it's it's kind of chilling. Sometimes I look at his helmets. The helmets are interesting because on the back of the helmets, they have that, remember that weird plastic tape that they used to label everything? I mean, even a, you look at the interior of a Porsche 917, it's got that tape on it for like oil and temp and, you know, fuel. Label making Yeah, that stuff. weird yeah. label making tape. It's on the back of all his helmets. It has his, has his date of birth back there. Uh, it has his blood type, and then under it, it has this thing that it's always interesting. I always quiz people. It says, um, it says, um, it tetanus. tetanus. Yeah, it says tetanus. It says the date of his last tetanus shot. It just says T-E-T -T and a date. And no one, everyone looks at it and goes, what the we, hell? We had to, Is that Bill knows? We had, <laughs> we had to have that on it. it right, it had to be on your helmet. That was a requirement. That's right. And you had to have your blood type on your suit and stuff like that so that if, if you were unconscious, anything happened, the paramedics, the doctors, everybody had the information they didn't have to track somebody down. Yeah. So it was a mandatory deal. But yeah, mine just, I just have Gemini in the back of my head. Like, <laughs> I want people to know, you know, where, where I am What's from an sign? astrological standpoint, <laughs> you know, not so much into the safety. So before we, before we wrap this up, we'll invite our next guest up, Bob Scanlon. Come on up, Bob. So let me introduce you to Bob Scanlon. Bob Scanlon uh, worked at ESPN, and he and a bunch of guys at ESPN started Speed Vision. And what year was that, Bob? 1995. Bob left um, Speed Vision and when, when Fox bought it and started Velocity Channel, um, which turned into Motor Trend. And so Bob has been basically the impetus of all automotive programming that we watch on TV from the start of Speed Vision right through Velocity. And now Bob retired, so he said, when Motor Trend took over. And I knew he wasn't going to retire. And I said, when you figure out what you want to do, I want to be part of it. So today we're going to make a special announcement that Speed Vision is back. It's back. All right. <laughs> So what we've done, Wayne and I had a couple of conversations. We had dinner and we knocked around some ideas. There was a, at the time, the cable industry, which is where my entire career had been, except for a short stint at ABC Sports. The entire cable industry was changing. And those of you who are cord cutters and tired of paying the bills and going to watch other, other ways to get entertainment are the reason for that change. And there was a new delivery system and economic model called FAST, which stands for free ad-supported television. So that's stuff that you watch now that's becoming very popular. So the change in the business is why we saw this opportunity and said, you know, if we can raise a little money and get out there and get on these streaming platforms like Amazon, Amazon Prime, Freevee, Fubo, Pluto, and, and all of the others and get on these smart TVs that are being spit out, you know, at a loss by manufacturers just to get markets, market cap. If we could do that, we might have a chance. And so we raised some seed capital. 
we went quietly and the, uh, the Speed Vision trademark had lapsed. Fox had let it go uh, to La La Land. So we went and got it, got back to Wayne, raised some money, and we are now, by September, we'll be on 16 platforms. So if you have a smart TV and you have Roku or Freevee or Pluto or any of the other Amazon, you can find Speed Vision. I will admit it is not easy. The search functions on these fast platforms are pretty dysfunctional. And there's a big learning curve because this really is the Wild West for media. But we are back, and Wayne will be back too. That's right. So, yeah. we, got, we have new shows coming great out. Great news. Congratulations. Shows Thank coming you. out. We, we want to leave a little time for some questions. So um, if anyone's got a question now, we got some microphones out there. Yep. Gentleman right here. And uh, sir, um, just because you're the first question, we're going to give you a hat, a talking classic cars hat. And we have four or five more. So, But one thing. Keep and your, more? Will keep, there be more? Keep your questions short. Oh, very short. Running out Please. Time. Very keep short. It short. This is for Danny Sullivan. Scott Speed, who I think has the greatest name in motor. Great night. Totally. Great name. What happened to him in Formula One? Um, Scott didn't. Basically, he didn't put enough work in and an effort in. He thought it his career had been like this, and he thought it was pretty easy and came to find out that it wasn't. That was part of the problem. And then Dietrich Matsushita, because it was with Toro Rosso then, he had turned over the deal to Gerhard Berger, and he told Gerhard that he could have part of the team if he could make it profitable. And they were paying Scott Speed, and he wanted a driver that was paying them. I think also with F1 drivers, once it starts going wrong, yeah, it just... Well, so is it not just F1, actually. When it starts going wrong, it just carries on going south. Yeah, and he and Gerhard were, did not like each other. And then remember, he came back and raced NASCAR for them for a while, and then he had a lot of success when he went into the WRX or whatever they called the, the series at the time, Rallycross and all that. He won, a bunch, he won two championships. We have another question over here. Quickly, is a previous huge fan of Speed Vision. Any, tell me about your content and any chance of bringing Dave Despain back. Oh, wait, I'd like to answer this question. I want some vintage racing on Speed Vision. Yeah. I cannot find vintage racing. Okay. I don't want to see another guy in a shop in Texas with tattoos arguing with another in- idiot <laughs> about who cracked the windshield. Yeah. I want some vintage racing. You will never see that Please. Con- that conflict crap on Speed Vision. I will tell you this. I am very close to, in my first iteration at Speed Vision, I bought a film library, and on his own, he would go out in the 50s and 60s and shoot at Indy, sports car races, Formula One. I'm really close to buying that library back, and we'll be able to convert those films to video and be able to go and narrate. And, and, and yeah. also we're, we're working with um, the Isle of Man TT people. So try, try to get that. So it's all going to be really good stuff. That's so, the definition of insane. The Isle of Man yes. TT is for nutcases only. Any other questions? Any other questions? All right. All right, we got one more. We got one. I have a friend that's really into F1 and his whole family, and he starts talking about tires. What, what was your question? Can't hear. The question is, he says that F1 driving is not about driver greatness it's about tires tire management tire all management. that kind of stuff yes yeah. well it's, it's an important factor but um that's everybody's got it everybody's got to do it so it's well you've all got group. the same tires so yeah. it's about how you bring them in and up to temperature yeah. and how you use them and maintain them yeah. but i think driver greatness i mean we've seen you know some of the f1 drivers driving on tires that have passed their prime but they are still keeping the lead or, or even overtaking. Yeah, the, um, great, the greatest story of that was two years ago in Abu Dhabi when Lewis, Lewis Hamilton, Hamilton. Was, was leading the race on old tires, 41 laps old. That, uh, the last Max had put, well, but before that, Max had put on tires and Lewis pulled away from him and he was on new tires and Lewis was on old, old. tires. And then, unfortunately, yeah, the safety the, car and the, yeah, yeah, the restart. The, it's it's, it's still about the driver. And but you know, the the greatest thing we have today is simulators. And so I spoke to Dominic Dobson the other day, and Dominic, in his first run up Pikes Peak, won rookie. And that's something. And so everybody asked, "How did you do it, Dominic?" He says, "I had a simulator, and I ran 80." runs up the hill on the simulator and I knew that course inside now so simulators Pre- are preparation is a preparation yes, yeah that's a good yeah. answer all right any other questions this is right in the front row oh. we have an Adam Carolla fan in the front row my wife <laughs> my wife probably has a question for Adam 
I actually have lots of questions for Adam, but I, this one's for Danny. How much of it, tagging on to his question, how much of it is the driver versus the car? That's a question that is never ending. I, I think the car and the team are important, um, but I don't think you can take a bad driver and put him in Max's car and expect him to win. So I, I don't know if I'd put a percentage to it, but as a driver, I'd like to say it's like 95% driver. <laughs> and, as a driver. In, in reality, in reality you're, you, you can't do it without them, so you're probably 60, 40, something like that. Um, but it's pr pretty tough to take a bad driver in the, or the other way around. Max would have a very hard time in some cars to do what he's doing. Yeah. You know, I want to thank our panelists, um, everyone. Bill is off stage, but everybody's up here. Bill, and, thank you. And um, we're going to have a, a toast coming up. And uh, the toast is to welcome Amanda to the Pebble Beach Concour. Right. And uh, so everybody stick around for that. I mean, we all get a free drink. Is that, is that, do we all get a free drink so, right now? Okay, so perfect. how this works is if you already have a glass in your hand, empty or full, please raise it to Miss Amanda Stratton, yeah. our newest team member. Yay, Beach, welcome Cordial to Pebble Beach. Yay, Amanda. Welcome, welcome. Yay. Nothing like being put on the spot. Yay. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Charles, she's embarrassed. <laughs> we want to thank everyone for coming. We had a great audience thank today, you. and Amanda, we're so happy Amanda, you came. Thank you all. Adam, and take your, take your magazines thank with you. you, too. Thanks so much, everybody. And from the Pebble Beach Concorde Elegance. <laughs> Classic Car Forums, uh, sponsored by Alliant Private Client. We thank you for joining us. We invite you to exit through Retro Auto, the doors to your right. We'll see you on Sunday morning. <laughs>